Okay, so well, hello to everybody there. I, I guess you can see me. We'll probably switch to the presentation in a moment. Um, so, yeah, my name is Gareth O'Neill. I'm Irish. I've lived in the Netherlands for about 20 years. And uh, I guess today we're going to talk about open access and Plan S. Um, now, my background on this is I've been involved in open access and open science in the Netherlands for many years, uh, specifically with a focus on the researcher side. So, most of the uh, work being done on open access and on, uh, well, Plan S particularly, comes from the policy back background. So the government side, institutional side, or the funding side. And many times uh, these policies do not often align with uh, what the researchers want or actually do. Uh, so myself, many others uh, in Europe have been trying to work uh, to shape open access and to make sure that open access and Plan S works for the people who have to actually do it, aka the researchers. Uh, and then specifically my background is on early career researchers. For Plan S, uh, I'm one of the, the so-called ambassadors. I will show you a bit uh, later on what that means. Um, and, and basically what that also means is that, for instance, we try to engage the research community or stakeholders uh, to explain what the principles are behind this, uh, why it is there, and then uh, to move forward and help shape and develop this so that it's a success. Uh, I think you can see my presentation, so I'll let, you, I'll let you switch to the presentation and then I'll ask you to skip to the next slide. So you should see summary, is that correct? Yes. Okay, then uh, I'll skip the summary so, and then I know where you are, so let's go to the next slide. And you should see Plan S built on strong principles. Yes. So many people ask why uh, Plan S came about. It seemed to be a shock for many individuals. Uh, for, for many people working in open access in, in Europe, it wasn't really a shock. So the bottom line is that we've been trying to get open access for easily, I guess, over 20 years. Uh, there's been many, many policy initiatives moving towards this, such as the Berlin Declaration on Open Access uh, back, I think, in the early 2000s. And one of the key ideas uh, behind Plan S was that uh, research is ultimately, a, so I'll be careful what I say now, publicly funded research is and should be a public good uh, and that we should be careful with how uh, we spend the money to open up access to uh, research. And the issue that many uh, European libraries faced and still face is that they have a certain budget uh, for uh, making research publications open and for publishing, uh, and that that amount, of, the amount of money that they're spending, is actually just increasing. Well, I was going to say catastrophically, that might be the case, but certainly it's increasing drastically. Um, and the opposite is true that the their access and ability to publish in venues and journals is not exactly increasing either, because when you have certain agreements uh, with publishing companies or publishing houses then uh, you do not always get access to everything and you don't always get everything at the same price. So it would be fair to say that there, there is a serious issue at the moment uh, for research libraries, for the budgets, that they, um, that they simply, simply cannot afford to pay for, to publish and access everything that they would like and that those budgets are decreasing and the costs are increasing. So we have a problem. Uh, and the problem is basically to open up the research, to be able to publish research in... I will say, methodologically sound uh, journals or platforms and to get that at the right price. And when I say the right price, I mean a price uh, that we pay for a value-added service to do this. So uh, Plan S, it's, it's quite simple, really, what Plan S wants. Uh, it's two, two things, I guess, if I summarize. It's full and immediate open access. So full open access uh, essentially means that... Uh, so I'll backtrack a little. If we have a, a, a typical subscription journal, so for instance, uh, a journal where you a library must uh, pay to get a subscription to the journal, and then any members of that library or researchers attached to that library uh, can gain access to these articles. That means that if you do not have access through your library, you hit a so-called paywall. And that means that you have to pay pretty much per article in many cases. That could be five euros, it could be 10 euros, it could be 200 uh, euros. Typically depends on the journal, maybe even on the author, uh, but you'll see varying prices. So full open access, this, 
this is essentially closed open access. You, on the other side of the spectrum, you have a full open access uh, journal. Uh, this would be where all articles are made immediately, uh, or perhaps even with an embargo, but in any case, they are made open. So that means that you would have a journal with no closed articles, no paywalled articles. It's free to access. I won't go into the publishing for now, but in any case, it's free to access. And in the middle, you have a kind of, well, it's called hybrid, but you have a hybrid model. Or there are others, but let's keep this simple. And the hybrid model basically says that a subscription journal, which has closed articles and subscriptions with libraries, can open up some articles. There's usually an additional fee uh, called an APC, an article processing charge. And that's, that's essentially a fee you pay to make the article open. So this is a hybrid model where you have some closed articles and some open articles in the same journal or even in the same uh, edition. Now, this hybrid model, uh, was it was hoped, I think, ten, five to ten years ago that this hybrid model would encourage publishers to make a step towards full open access. In other words, to slowly and gradually move away from uh, subscription journals and subscriptions and move towards a model where all articles would uh, be open and a full journal would be open. What has unfortunately happened in the meantime is that the number of hybrid, hybrid journals has uh, ballooned and that the hybrid model itself has become a sustainable model for many publishers. In other words, they're not necessarily transitioning towards a full open access model. Then the second uh, word that I will use is immediate open access. So this means that uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll use a couple of more words. If we take the, the process where an article is created, so we have a draft of an article following research, it gets sent to uh, an editor or to a journal, it gets submitted, it goes under review. If you're lucky, you might get accepted immediately. If you're typically normal, you'll get uh, sent back for revisions. But in any case, at some point, you resend your article and it gets accepted by uh, the journal, by the editor. This is called the author accepted manuscript. Uh, this is not the version that is stamped, branded and cleaned up by the publisher. That version we call the version of record. So the final, final version that is put online, the go to version, basically. And what Plan S says is that we want immediate open access, as in either the author accepted manuscript or the version of record to be opened the moment it is accepted or the moment it is made, uh, it is published. This means that they do not want delays or do not want embargo periods. So what can typically happen with subscription uh, journals is you submit an article, uh, it's, it's locked down, so it's put under subscription, but then there may be a so-called embargo period. This can typically be six months or 12 months or in some cases even 24 months. The idea there is that your article falls under subscription for that embargo period, and when the embargo period is uh, finished, it then fully opens. And the reason for this was so that publishers uh, could make uh, could make some money, let's say, from the moment they publish up until you know the the attention on this article, let's say, goes down, and they calculate that that's between six to twenty four months. So Plan S basically wants full uh, and immediate open access. Uh, I'll come back to some of the more specifics as we go through this. One or two of the other main principles here, are, so essentially no paywalls, that everybody should have the right to access a scientific publication the moment it is ready to be published. Uh, and then there's a couple of things that attach to this. There will be no copyright transfer. In other words, the copyright remains with the creator, which is typically the author and or the institution where the author works. Sometimes it's, it's both together. Um, and that, that in principle should be licensed under a CC BY uh, license. So if you know the Creative Commons licenses, there's different types. We have CC BY, this means attribution. You must, in any case, refer to the author or refer to the creator. You also have some others. You have CC uh, ND, no derivatives. This means that you can use this creation, the article, but you cannot adjust it in any form. You have non-commerciality. This means that uh, you can you can use the article for any uh, purposes you want, except commercial exploitation, so you cannot make money on it. Uh, and you have what's called uh, CCSA, share alike, or what's called copyleft. So whatever, however I license my uh, my creation, my article, 
if you use it, you must use the same license. So Plan S asks specifically for a CC by license, meaning uh, my name, the institution's name goes on it. We retain our copyright and then we stamp it very clearly that you can use this for whatever purposes you want, but you must reference the author slash creator. Uh, in other words, you must reference me and perhaps Leiden University if I write this article. Uh, okay, and then the final one is about transparency. This is just some of the main principles before we go into some more details. So when, when they talk about uh, transparency, they talk about transparency in pricing and transparency in the contracts that are made. So in the pricing, uh, it's it's often the case that you pay a certain fee to, for instance, publish or, for instance, to make your article open access. But it's not quite clear why you're getting this particular number. And this is a, this becomes obvious when you have widely different uh, article processing charges. So, for instance, some uh, open access venues may charge uh, 200 euros an APC. Some may charge 500. Some may charge 1,000 uh, if you look at some of the uh, Springer Nature open access venues, you'll see that the APC is typically between 1,000 and 2,500 euros. But then you'll also see some types of nature communications or some of the other, let's say, higher end, high impact factor journals uh, will charge a lot more, typically between 3,000 to 5,000 euros, if not more. So the transparency that is asked here from Plan S is essentially that um, there will be more more transparency in the pricing, not necessarily all of the breakdowns, but a rough idea of why we are paying a certain amount and what exactly are we getting for this amount, uh, akin to getting an invoice at a restaurant. So, you know, if you go to a restaurant and you get a bill of 100 euros and it just has 100 euros food, you might not be so happy. You would like to know what exactly you have paid for, uh, what is the, the VAT that is on top of this, and does it does it match what you expected? So I would like to see the starter, the main course, the meal, the drinks, and anything else that I put on there. Then you have uh, the contracts. So typically for many of the libraries, um, they sign big deal contracts with uh, publishing, the big publishers. This means that they have a certain package of uh, access and publishing rights with certain uh, journals, and then they pay a, a, typically a large amount of money for access for a limited period. It could be one year, it could be three years. Very often these contracts are closed or even, uh, uh, let's say, stuck with a non-disclosure agreement. And so the word for this is the secret deal, the secret big deal. And Plan S also asks for more transparency in these types of contracts. What are the institutions paying? How much are they paying exactly? What are they getting for that payment? And then when we see roughly how this is working, what is it we feel we should be paying? So some more transparency in the pricing and the contracts. I'm going to skip to the next slide. That's great. And this should say Plan S built on strong principles. You should start with publication fees at the top. You can carry on. Okay. Um, so uh, these are some more of the principles. So in principle, so there are ten principles of Plan S. Uh, I'm going through. I went through the main ones. Let's say uh, these are some more of the, the more detailed principles. So one of it is that the publication fees should be transparent and reasonable. So as you can see, this links directly to the transparency in pricing. If we know roughly what it costs, then uh, you know, we should be able to pay what we feel is the right amount. This, this, is, this will not be a, a one particular, this would not be a one amount uh, stop shop, let's say. Uh, we would assume a type of window for depending on, on how many, uh, for instance, journals a publishing house is running, what exactly is required for that uh, journal, what are the processes that that journal is, is, is using, uh, so that we can get a good ballpark figure of how much we should be paying for particular journals. This is principle five. Then the next one is principle four, that the funders, so the funders who sign up to Plan S, that they commit uh, to support these publication fees. That means the individual researchers falling under their grants uh, must not, will not pay individually or personally. So in other words, the funders will pay directly or perhaps the funding will come from the research grant, uh, but they will never have to pay for the article processing charge. And how that will uh, actually work technically, so how that will work uh, and how will it be streamlined, that's exactly what uh, Plan S is, is working on now at the moment. Number five is that there is no one model. So many people have said that this is perhaps a gold APC model, so if we, if we take three simple models, let's say, uh, we have, for instance, uh, what I will call 
no altar facing fee venues or what is typically called platinum or what is also called diamond uh, journals. This is a journal that essentially uh, does not charge to publish and does not charge uh, to access the, the article. So it's a free model at the point of use. It does not mean it's not, it's, it's free. It always costs money. Somebody's paying, but the money is typically in the background. That's a diamond venue. Nobody pays to read. Nobody pays to access. We also have what's called green open access. That's where you take a version of the article. Uh, for Plan S, that would be the author accepted manuscript or the version of record. Uh, for others, that could be a preprint. But you take a, a, a version of the article, typically a draft or pre-version, and you put that in an, a library or institutional repository. So uh, an earlier version is put somewhere where everybody can access it, and that typically does not incur costs. The issue there, however, is if the funder, if the publishers always allow you to actually do this, if they have issues with this, and which draft they will allow you. So many researchers, for instance, will put an article on their website, and then they may get an email from the publisher, uh, a takedown notice saying, please remove this. Uh, you know, we have the rights to this. They need to come through us. And if they need to pay, then they, of course they have to pay. So the key to principle four here is that the re individual researchers uh, like me should not have to pay for this. All funding for the publication fees and for accessing should come through the funders. Then we have, uh, yes, so back to the multiple routes then. We have a final version, which is um, gold APC model, linking directly to what I've just said. And gold APC technically means that the article is put immediately online on the publisher's platform or website. What it has come to mean is that we pay money for publishers to do this. So if I want to publish in a, a journal uh, and if I want to make it open access, then there will be an additional fee, this so-called article processing charge. I pay the APC and then the article is made immediately open access and you get this a uh, little open lock that you see down on the, I guess it's on the bottom right of the presentation. And what Plan S has said here is that they do not envision any one model for open access. They are not focused on gold APC or switching the system, let's say a subscription system to a paid gold APC uh, model. But they want to support all access models, meaning they will support green open access. They will support gold open access within boundaries and they will support uh, diamond platinum open access, although how they will do that needs to be uh, further developed. And the final major point here, so one of the, what they call the strong principles, principle 10, is that uh, it's all well and good to uh, want open access, to encourage open access, uh, to, to mandate open access, but a key issue here is that the researchers themselves need to be somehow rewarded for actually doing this, and absolutely not punished. So, one of the issues uh, that many researchers feel with open access journals is that they may not have a high impact factor or journal impact factor or a high brand. So typically what you see is that the, uh, the subscription journals or the journals with very high APCs, they are also typically the ones that have high impact factors or high branding. And what Plan S uh, is trying to do here is to support and encourage publishing in open access venues full stop. So not just the ones with high impact factor, not just the ones with branding, but also other open access journals that may not have such high prestige uh, in the research community. And following on from this, also in their career and research evaluations. So for instance, if I publish in an open access journal, I should get rewarded for this uh, when I come to my yearly uh, career assessment or when I'm going for a job somewhere, I should be rewarded for having done this. This ties not just to open access in principle, this ties to the much broader concept of open science, uh, which also includes, for instance, FAIR or open data, so making your data open. And the idea here is that the funders who support Plan S will themselves uh, sign what's called the DORA, uh, well, the Direct Declaration on Research Assessment, and that they will enact all of the guidelines of DORA such as they will remove uh, reference to journal impact factor and branding in career assessment, in research assessment, and that they will start training, supporting, and rewarding uh, their researchers in open science. Uh, the key issue here is that you are not rewarded uh, for the number of art articles that you have. You are not rewarded for where you publish. You are rewarded for what you do. So the act of doing research, the act of publishing, uh, the act of doing open access. 
rather than simply the name of the venue or the name of the journal where you publish. So because it has a high prestige, you get rewarded for this. So Plan S, Coalition S, the people behind Plan S are actively trying uh, to develop policies on this now. And I can tell you that just a couple of days ago, the Netherlands released a national strategy to achieve this, uh, let's say separate from Plan S, uh, but essentially saying the same thing, that they will completely revise their career assessment and research assessment uh, procedures to include open science, open access, and issues related to planets. Uh, next slide. Proceed. And you should have implementation guidance in front of you. I'll give it one second for it to switch. Okay, so we have implementation guide, key changes. So what happened was Plan S was released in September 2018. Uh, there was a lot of uh, responses, positive, negative, and commotion uh, from the research community and especially from the publishing community. Um, and what happened was they issued 10 principles and they issued a set of guidelines uh, and people commented, many organizations commented on this uh, initial draft, let's say, to give input to Coalition S. What Coalition S then did was they uh, revised some of the, uh, they looked at the principles, they looked at the comments that came in and they set up what they called an implementation guidance. So how are we actually going to do this? What are the main key issues of Plan S and how are we going to achieve it? This was a relatively uh, technical document, so it was about seven pages long. It also went into technical details for the repositories uh, and for the, the publishing platforms themselves. And they opened up what they called an open consultation for all stakeholders to comment on what they felt about the principles and about the guidelines. And as a consequence of this, they received in a very short space of time about 600 responses, 250 organizational responses and 350 individual researcher responses. Uh, this is all online. You can find it if you're interested. And then they took all of these comments, they synthesized it, uh, they went back to the drawing board, let's say, with some of the funders in Plan S, and then they revised again their uh, principles and guidance to what we have uh, now, which you will find online. And some of the key changes in there uh, was the timing. So some, some researchers felt that this was too short. So Planus originally intended uh, to have all the principles ready to roll in the funders who signed up by January the 1st, 2020. And then after the, comment uh, after the commentary, they basically shifted this one year to January 2021. Uh, the second one was that they gave a much more focused and developed opinion on what are called transformative agreements. So contractual agreements with publishers, uh, which basically nudge, push, encourage the publishers to move to a fully open access system. And the timeline here on this is 2024. So contracts that will be signed now or in the future should be ending by 2024. And Plan S will, will sponsor and support and, and fund such, uh, 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 let's put this differently, not necessarily fund, but allow such transformative agreements within the framework up until 2024. So the timeline here for Plan S is, is, is quite uh, restricted. The principles and guidelines should be set in place and starting to be implemented by January 2021. And then any contracts that are rolling over or being signed in the next year or couple of years must have ended by 2024 if they're to fall under the scope of Plan S. Uh, what they also did was uh, explain clearly uh, the models that Plan S will push so many from the research community felt that Plan S was pushing strongly towards a gold APC model. This was corrected and stated clearly that it is not about gold APC. It is about uh, supporting sus many ways, let's say, to open access, for instance, including green open access or to even diamond open access to some extent, and that there should not be any one business model, but that there should be a, an array of business models to achieve this. Coalition S is in principle business model agnostic. Uh, th there has been a study just done under the banner of Coalition S, I think by the Wellcome Trust in the UK. And this was to look at possible business models to help uh, society publishers, society journals flip to open access. And I believe that they came up with 27 business models. So this is just to give you an indication of the work being done and also the many different ways uh, to open access. I'm going to go to the next slide. And you should have here implementation guidance, routes to compliance. Okay, so you should see a kind of matrix in front of you. 
uh, on the left you'll have root and then funding and on the top you'll have open access publishing venues uh, middle subscription venues and then on the right side transition of subscription venues so this is the crux of plan s especially for the researchers and the, and the libraries and this is how you can be compliant with plan s now compliance here means that if I, as a researcher, am funded by a Plan S funder, for instance, NWO in the Netherlands, the research funder, uh, then I must meet these certain criteria. So this tells me how I can be compliant. What it also means is that if I'm using money, so this is twofold. If the funder mandates me to publish anything that comes out from my funding, uh, research-wise, to publish in Plan S compliant journals, that means that whether I pay or not, the article in principle should be compliant. If I pay, it should fall under the compliance rules for gold APC uh, and also re related to green open access if I put it in a repository. So reading across on the first row there for the route, the first route to open, uh, the first route to compliance is what they call the open access publishing venues. This could be a diamond venue or this could be a gold APC venue and I have to pay money. What Plan S says is that if, if they meet the criteria of Plan S, Coalition S will fund me to publish in that article. So very specifically what that means is if I want to publish in, uh, if I want to publish a linguistics article, which I need to do within two weeks, uh, to a, uh, a, a journal, if I want Coalition S, if, I, if my research is going to be compliant with Plan S, then I must publish open access. If they ha charge me, let's say, an APC of 2,000 euros, then uh, I need to check that that journal is compliant with Plan S. And if it is, then Coalition S will pay the 2,000 euro APC from either a centralized pot of money or from my research grant. But in principle, it will be covered by Coalition S once it meets the criteria. So this is what we can call the gold route. Not necessarily needs to be gold, but let's call it the gold route. The middle one here is the green route, the repositories. Uh, so this means that if I, for instance, decide to publish in a, a subscription journal or a closed off journal, even with a, a so-called embargo, I can still be compliant if I release uh, a version in an institution repository. Coalition S is very happy if it's the version of record, but they will also, also accept the author's accepted manuscript. So the manuscript that I have sent to uh, the, the journal that they've accepted, but not necessarily branded and cleaned up. So if, if I am allowed to take the AAM, the author accepted manuscript, and put it in an institutional repository at no cost, I am compliant. This is called immediate green open access, and that would meet the criteria. An issue here that we see as researchers, so speaking with my researcher hat on, is that not all, many actually journals uh, probably are not too happy with releasing the author accepted manuscript, given it's so close to the version of record. Uh, and that's something that needs to be now discussed properly uh, with or between researchers, publishers, and funders. So how to get uh, publishers on board that if they're not willing to open up their journals, that they will be willing to allow green open access and open up the author accepted manuscript in institutional repositories. Uh, and there are studies on this which show that it, in principle, does not have a huge effect on, uh, on the business model of the publisher. So this is something that I think needs to be discussed more. The final option is what we call the transformative agreements. And this is essentially uh, this agreement between the, uh, well, typically a library and a publisher for a whole package of articles, or it could be a journal even. But the idea is that the agreement nudges the journal or the, the publisher to move to open access. And if it falls under the, the, the definition of a transformative agreement, then I can be compliant with Plan S. In other words, if NWO, uh, the research funder in the Netherlands, has an agreement with, for instance, Elsevier, uh, for uh, for a transformative agreement for publishing and reading, uh, and I publish in one of those journals, then I am compliant. So this is a key topic at the moment. Uh, what we're seeing in Europe now is a kind of flurry or increase towards these types of contracts, um, and more. And there seems to be more and more now being signed. What I do note is that these uh, contracts are typically between big con library consortia and big publishers. For instance, a recent uh, contract, to give you an example, was by Project Deal in Germany. So Project Deal is essentially a consortium of all the research libraries, the major ones, uh, who have come together to, let's say, collectively bargain with the publishers. And Project Deal just recently signed an agreement with uh, Wiley, uh, one of the big uh, publishing houses. Uh, this deal was worth somewhere in the region, don't quote me on this, but somewhere in the region of 27 million per year. 
uh, it will it will release somewhere around eight thousand plus, if not ten thousand articles. And just to give you a ballpark figure of what it costs, this is costing around two thousand seven hundred and fifty per article. So that is a clear uh, that is a clear decision and acceptance on on behalf of this consortium of libraries. They're willing to pay two thousand seven hundred and fifty to Wiley uh, to gain access and to publish in a package of the journals. I'm not sure if that's the full catalog of Wiley. I would be surprised if it was, but in any case, uh, Project Deal is happy with this. We see other consortia now are moving towards this to do it. Consortia in the Netherlands, uh, consortia in Sweden, uh, and maybe one of the the issues or one of the questions that you know we would have is how does this work with small uh, society publishers, journals? Are there going to be contracts made with them? And also, how does this work with small consortia or small uh, institutions? For instance, if you're a, a collection of 80 research libraries in a, the, one of the biggest countries in Europe with a massive budget, you have a lot of bargaining and negotiating power. If you're a small institution or a very small consortium, your bargaining power goes down. Maybe to give an example, a consortia in Norway just signed uh, an agreement, uh, contractual agreement with Elsevier, and that was working out at 3,800 or so per article. Uh, now, we could argue that it's a, they're different journals. Probably it's a different scope uh, without Sophia possibly having many more journals and so forth. But you can see that the prices are differing wildly across uh, the publishing houses and across the contracts. Okay. Uh, in that matrix that you're looking at, the bottom one, I won't go into that too much. That's just the funding side of this. Uh, but what that basically means is that Coalition S, if money is to be paid, will pay uh, depending on the model, and they expl explain what exactly they will do. So for the gold option, let's say, the, the open access venue where you, you may need to pay an APC, it says that the coalition S funders will support the publication fee. So if the journal is compliant with Plan S, for instance, it is full and immediate open access, they allow author-accepted manuscript or version of record to be opened, uh, and uh, they have some level of transparency in prices costs, and they follow, for instance, uh, allow no tr copyright transfer and CC BY. They are compliant. Plan S coalition as funders will pay for the APC. Moving to the middle box, the uh, green route, uh, what it says here is that coalition S will not financially support hybrid open access publication fees in the subscription venues. So they will not uh, pay to open this up. But what they will do is allow articles that are put in there and put into the repository to be compliant. So uh, that's, that's a matter then going down into the national funders. And the one on the right side here for these transformative agreements, and the operative word here is can. Coalition S funders can contribute financially to open access publishing under transformative agreements. That means that the funders may engage in these transformative agreements and pay from their own uh, funding, but not necessarily that they all will or must. So there is some flexibility left there uh, for the funders of Coalition S, for these national funders. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. And you should see uh, the implementation guidance key changes, and then you have like uh, the transformative agreements that are supported. And I'm keeping track of time. I'm going to try to stop by quarter past, so you know. Okay, so uh, this is just to give you then a bit more background into the types of transformative agreements or arrangements, as they call them, that they're looking at. Uh, the first one is the kind of typical uh, one that we have, the transformative agreement. So this is the agreement between uh, the, well, the libraries, I guess, to some extent, and the uh, publishers, uh, that the publishers will try to transition from a subscription-based model to an open access publishing model. And that the libraries will uh, support this by financially continuing this contractual agreement, but that the the, the uh, idea should be to open up uh, their their articles uh, slash journals. In other words, we sign an agreement, uh, which would have been a full subscription agreement, and now we sign an agreement where you're opening up all the articles. Now, the words that are typically used here are, are cost neutrality. So to make this attractive to publishers, what you see is that generally the funders are not asking for less money. What they're asking for is paying roughly the same amount but they want now open access. So in other words, we keep paying roughly what we're paying. This is to the tune of around 10 billion euros per year collectively uh, for scholarly publishing across the world. So uh, let's say 10 billion. Uh, and that the idea is that we, we keep paying that 10 billion in this model, 
but now we are getting fully open access uh, journals and articles. Uh, we could discuss whether it should be 10 billion, but that's another issue. But in any case, the idea here is that we uh, we do not pay more money. Uh, of course, it would be great if we could negotiate less money, but in principle, paying the same amount we're paying, we now get all articles to be open, full and immediate open access. The second thing the coalitionists is working on uh, are transformative model agreements. Uh, so these are the uh, actual legal technical agreements that are put in place uh, for tr transition and to make sure, for instance, in the agreement that there is no double payment or double dipping. I'll say that in a second. But also that publishing uh, society publishers, for instance, or smaller funders uh, have model agreements that they can use and, and adjust in their own negotiations. So not that everybody has to start from scratch. We have some of these agreements already. Uh, let's use them and let's build upon them. This comes back also to the transparency in contracts and pricing. So Coalition S is asking for many of the contracts to actually be opened. Now, this will not be the case for all. I do not know if the Norwegian, the Norway, Sweden, uh, sorry, the Norway Elsevier uh, contract is open. But I do know, for instance, that one of the uh, Wiley deal contracts, I think, is open. So you can find that online. You can look at the technical agreements. You can see the prices. You can see what they have literally agreed to and what they commit to. Uh, and then, of course, you can use that for your own model. And the last one here is, is a relatively interesting development, and this is a transformative journal. So moving from the collective bargaining package and focusing on an actual journal. If maybe a publisher only has one, or maybe you want to start with one and then spiral out, so opening journal by journal, but that you would set up a kind of transformative agreement for an actual journal. And that you would also try to offset this cost that you would need for the subscription publishing and move that towards an open access business model. This does not necessarily mean gold open access again to state that. It simply means that you're moving towards uh, a sustainable business model for open access and you're converting or transitioning from the subscriptions to open and that you're using the amount that you would pay for the subscriptions to make that open. Okay, I'm going to skip to the next uh, slide. This is just uh, coming back. Uh, to some of the changes that were in there and that will be supported. So I've already said that the uh, funders will commit to the DORA principles. I'll let you look that up more if you're not too clear of what they are, uh, that they will push for the transparency and the open access fees and the costing, well, the agreements and the pricing. Uh, this is something uh, that, that was very important for the research communities. Uh, at the time when I was president of Eurodoc, together we worked with the Marie Curie Alumni Association representing the Marie Curie Fellows, Eurodoc represents PhDs and postdocs from 28 countries across Europe. And we also worked with the Young Academy of Europe, which is a, a group of around two to 300 excellent grant winners, such as the ERC, the European uh, Research Council grants in Europe. And we had a problem with the CC BY license, specifically in the humanities. And the problem with this is in the humanities, uh, when you publish an article, in principle, in many cases, the article itself is the research. So whereas in the, let's say, the technical biomedical sciences, the hard sciences, you may, you may be able to separate the whole research data collection and procedural, uh, scientific procedural process from the actual reporting, in the humanities that line is somewhat more blurry. Uh, and very often that the article itself is your, your actual uh, process. And the problem with this is, in the humanities, uh, if you have an article with CC BY, it basically means that they only have to reference you. It, what it does mean is that they could adjust the wording, they could adjust the interpretation, which is crucial in the humanities, being a subjective, in many cases, uh, science, and they could also translate it and give a bad translation. So many researchers push to allow a CC BY ND license, meaning you add on a clause that this uh, cannot be adjusted without seeking permission from the creator, the author. So what that does is I write my article, I stamp it with CC BY ND, if someone wants to use it, they need to reference me. If they want to change it, they must come to me. If they want to translate it into, for instance, Portuguese, they must come to me and I must okay this and I can set up an agreement where maybe I get to check the translation before it goes out. 
And if they are going to interpret it and adjust it, let's say, completely different, even in the same language, again, they must come to me and explain this before it happens. So this is this is a way to, let's say, ease some of the concerns that the humanities had. This does not say it will always be accepted, but simply that the option of an exception is there. Researchers can apply for it, and then it will be looked at case by case. Uh, and I won't go into the technical details. There's a whole list of them. But basically, platforms need to agree to a certain list of technical requirements if they to, are to be compliant, a compliant open access venue. For instance, they must use HTML. This is a random example. Uh, and they must meta, use particular standards for metadata. Um, I will let you look at that. But in any case, there's a whole list of what the technical criteria should be. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to close off quickly enough over the next five-ish minutes. Uh, next slide, you should see alignment of open access policies. These are the funders. And this is the current state of affairs of the membership of Plan S. So what we have is uh, a whole range of national funders in Europe. These, th This is not necessarily the funder in each country because it varies differently in Europe. You could have one funder, for instance, for research, or you could have four, as in some countries. Uh, what this shows you is just some of them who have joined on. For instance, NWO in the Netherlands, or the Research Council of Norway, or UKRI in the UK, or FWF in Austria, or for instance, uh, the Luxembourg National Research Fund. So these are crucial. These are the national funders who commit to supporting and implementing Plan S, uh, moving towards their researchers, paying for it, and basically checking that it's, it's taking place. Then underneath, you have some big organizations who are more charitable or internationally based. Uh, two, well, three of the big ones really are the Wellcome Trust in the UK. Uh, this, I think, has a budget of around a billion per year. We have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the US. It's around two billion a year. Then we have the World Health Organization, and we have TDR for research on uh, diseases and poverty. So four major charities here. And then underneath, this is fully supported and committed uh, by the European Commission and specifically by the European Research Council. This means in the long run, uh, that all project funding coming from the European Commission should in some, at some point align towards Plan S and in principle enact Plan S, the Plan S principles. So for instance, the, research, uh, the current research funding program in Europe is called Horizon 2020. I think it was worth around 70, 75 billion over a course of seven years. And in 2021, we will move into the next framework program for seven years. This is called Horizon Europe. And an interesting question here to, and to be discussed is to what extent Plan S will be implemented and realized in the next funding program. And if it is uh, mandated, let's say, in Horizon Europe, that means that all projects being funded under Horizon Europe, and this is currently stands at 95 billion euros, is estimated to be put into this uh, funding program, they must publish in open access following the criteria of Plan S. So this will be an interesting uh, development. I'm curious to see how that works. I'm going to skip to the next slide. All I can say about the funders is that uh, there are more joining, one or two left, interestingly, uh, and we do see more joining. So it will be interesting to see how many we have when we move into uh, January 2020 as we start moving towards real implementation. Okay, how this works, uh, Coalition S is essentially uh, a set of funders, let's say around 20, uh, and they, they align across each other and coordinate uh, and that's that middle box there. You should see governance. So the middle box here is the coalition as members. They have organized themselves into a leaders group. Uh, so leaders coming from each of the funders. And they've organized themselves into an executive steering group. So key representatives from all of the funders who make the decisions uh, surrounding Coalition S. And then they are supported uh, in different ways. So internally, they're supported by a comms group, an expert group, uh, and, and different task forces focusing on different topics. For instance, how to flip society publishers. And they are also uh, practically and administratively supported by the so-called office. So this involves a coordinator, a program manager, and with several assistants to help the coalition as a whole uh, work on Plan S. Those two are chaired by the president of Science Europe, Mark Schiltz, uh, who is currently president. Uh, and this is an interesting relationship between the two. Science Europe is the collection of research funders in Europe. I don't know the full figure, but it's definitely about 40 plus, 45 perhaps. Uh, and this is the big umbrella of research funders in Europe. Coalition S did not sign or, or make Plan S, so to speak. Uh, this was essentially um, uh, not supported, I think, by all of the members. 
So they allowed flexibility within the membership and we ended up with Coalition S, which is a subset of funders from Science Europe plus funders from outside of Europe. Uh, okay, and then what we have is for, let's say, outreach and engagement, Coalition S has, has just um, uh, hired, let's say, an open access champion. This is Johan Rohreich, who is also from Leiden University. Uh, he is famous for being editor-in-chief of Lingua, an old Elsevier journal. Uh, and to cut a long story short, Johan and 34 or 32 of the editors uh, and uh, key editors of the editorial board uh, all resigned en masse from uh, Lingua, from the Elsevier journal. They had been trying to move uh, Lingua to a full open access venue, which was unfortunately not supported by Elsevier. So after many rounds of negotiations, they all resigned, uh, left their positions, and they immediately created a new open access venue called Glossa, uh, run by them, owned by the editorial board and uh, open for peer review in full open access to the research community. Uh, so this is Johan's background here. And then Johan is supported by a whole group of what we call ambassadors. Uh, if you can slip to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, these are some of the ambassadors. I guess I am one of them. And the idea here was to have uh, key representatives from uh, the research community, also uh, who are involved, for instance, in the publishing contracts or who are involved in their own institutions or who are involved in their societies, uh, to act as a kind of face for Plan S, uh, to engage in discussion with the communities, uh, and then you know to take Plan S forward as in a collaborative effort. My particular uh, background on this uh, or, or focus is for early career researchers. So my goal is to make sure that Plan S passes information that is needed to the researcher community, specifically the early researcher community, PhDs and postdocs, uh, and then to also engage from the other side any of the concerns raised by the research community with Coalition S. So we have, for instance, a closed uh, mailing list. We meet online regularly. And then any issues that are coming up, we put forward to Coalition S, discuss this, and basically make sure that Coalition S is taking this into account when they're developing their policy and their implementation. Uh, I won't go into any of the other details here, just to say that these ambassadors are always willing to engage and communicate online, or for instance, give talks. Uh, my apologies, I couldn't come to South Africa, but I did in any case make sure I was online. Uh, and maybe what I will do is, I'm not going to go through everything here, you can, you're free to send that uh, presentation around. Um, but what I will say is, uh, if we can skip ahead, I'm going to go to one particular slide. So if you can go to slide number, let me find this, 20. I'll give you one moment. Okay. You should see other activities. So these are basically the priority actions for Coalition S. This will give you an indication of where Coalition S wants to go. Uh, you have the link there that you can, uh, well, type in or click the work plan. Uh, and I'm going to read through them. There's nine. These, this came out also after the consultation with the uh, stakeholders. So Coalition S acknowledges that there's a wide range of work to be done to implement Plan S, some of which is noted at various points in the revised implementation guidance, and that they've identified these priorities for, let's say, the next year. So from June 2019, moving forward for six months to a year. Number one, uh, they will appoint an open access champion who will promote Plan S to research funders and other stakeholders. So that is Johan. I guess they've done that. Number two, establish the Coalition S Secretariat and develop a budget to take the work forward. So this coalition S was essentially a network of funders who came together uh, and were, were basically pooling their resources. But the key was to make coalition S an, a type of uh, entity in itself with its own support structure. So this is the idea of the secretariat, that they will have their own secretary and administrative support staff to help them. They are now literally in the process of setting this up. I see that there's some uh, vacancy notices gone out to hire staff. So this is pushing... Uh, the coalition forward to start recruiting even more funders and to start uh, working in a coordinated manner across all of the funders and not simply down the lines uh, at national levels. Number three, uh, convene meetings of the existing members of Coalition S to share insights and address challenges in implementing Plan S. So this is bringing all of the members together, at least key representative of all the funders, and to discuss the key priorities and topics that need to be addressed and to somehow engage the research community in this process. For instance, perhaps structurally involving researcher associations 
or structurally involving researchers in focus groups. Number four, work together to articulate a vision for the long-term future of open access. So following on from three. Number five, set up a task force to develop a framework to monitor the effects of Plan S on the research and scholarly communication ecosystems. This is a crucial one. Uh, how do we know what exactly is happening and who's doing what? And how do we know if it's succeeding? And following on from this, what do we do if they're not doing it? Uh, to what extent are you going to, for instance, monitor and, uh, and let's say, punish researchers for not doing it? Our position has always been that you should be uh, light in this approach, uh, that you should definitely figure out a, a streamlined way to monitor compliance, but not that you should be punishing all acts of non-compliance. There should be a supportive framework here where researchers are supported to do this uh, and, you know, help them shift towards open access, particularly through the reward system. Six, a task force to identify where it is difficult to comply with Plan S, uh, how to address the issues and give researchers the crucial information they need. Seven, work with the publishers, societies, consortia and everybody else involved on these transformative agreements so that we can move towards full and immediate open access. A key uh, stakeholder here really is the publishers and especially the society publishers. Uh, I can tell you that I've been involved in many discussions with particularly society publishers who want to move to Plan S, who are very positive about moving to an open access model, but they're not clear, not sure, and a bit concerned about the business model that will be there. Uh, and this is a fair criticism. Many of the, the society publishers, for instance, have, have deals with publishers where they may uh, outsource the uh, running of their journal or journals to a publisher. The publisher will organize the peer review. The publisher will organize pretty much everything involved in that journal. For instance, uh, the platform uh, sending the reviews out to the research community, uh, copy editing, translations if need be checking that everything makes sense, maybe doing a data check, and then finally publishing and setting up the platform. Uh, and the, the question here for many of these is, and sorry, just to follow on from this, in many of these agreements, uh, the publisher may actually give a financial contribution back to the society. And the society will then use this as revenue to uh, run some of their activities like conferences or inviting early career researchers to attend events or newsletters or whatever. So this is a question mark for many society publishers who are not yet sure what business model they should be using to move to open access of Plan S. Uh, eight, work with the publisher representatives and other stakeholders to define the various services. Publishers will be asked to price. So this comes back to the transparency. What are we paying for? What is happening in this uh, publication process? Uh, and what should we be paying when we look at all of these uh, processes and activities, especially taking into account that the taxpayer and the researcher pays for and funds the research, collects, visualizes, summarizes, analyzes the data, writes up the report, edits the journal, reviews the articles, resubmits after corrections the articles, and then finally passes this on to be published. So taking that into account, what should we be paying? And number nine, begin discussions to explore the best ways to implement rights retention for authors and institutions, recognizing national disciplinary and other differences. So copyright is an issue here uh, that differs in, to some extent across European states. There is a, a European copyright directive, and that's just been in the middle of being adjusted right now. Uh, and also how the institutions themselves see the copyright question. So for instance, in Leiden, uh, we, we automatically uh, do not own the copyright ourselves we co-own it to an extent with the university. So it's never Gareth O'Neill, it's Gareth O'Neill slash Leiden University. So to what extent uh, does that have effects on Plan S, copyright retention and the licensing? In principle, if Leiden University uh, is the co-copyright holder, they decide the license, not Gareth. So in many cases with articles, this is of course not what happens. I decide the license, uh, I pass it on, the, the university either doesn't look or turns a blind eye, let's say, or is happy with my decision. But if we look much deeper, in principle, the institutions should have a key role in this because they're also co-copyright holder in some cases. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it there. I'll leave the link on the line here, coalitionness.org, and then you can have a look at the work plan. I think maybe just to summarize very briefly, uh, Plan S is about full and immediate open access. Uh, it has been a highly contentious and discussed topic in Europe. Uh, given the fact that uh, open access itself is linked to uh, prestige branded journals, high impact factor journals, um, that it's also linked to the whole incentives and reward systems for researchers 
who are not currently being rewarded for doing open access or open science, um, and that the goal of Plan S really is uh, to move towards an open access system of publications so that everybody has access to scientific publications when they are published, not after, and uh, also that everybody has access to publish uh, in such venues. I'll leave it there, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to shoot them up. Thank you, Gareth. Um, I'm going to op open the floor now for questions, so um, I'm, I'm asking anyone for questions now. I've got a question myself, and that is uh, that relates to the 10 billion that you refer to. Um, yeah. That uh, someone needs to pay the the funders yes. that you speak to. So, so that I assume then that open access is still not really open unless um, a research uh, research is associated with um, one of those funders or through institutions with one of those funders. So, open is someone still needs to pay. Yes. Somebody will always pay. This is, this is never a free venture, right? And to be blunt, it's the taxpayer that's usually paying uh, for public research, uh, certainly at the institutions and universities. So the issue is not that, that we want to pay. Uh, we must pay. Uh, the issue is if that 10 billion is what we should be paying, and if we are paying 10 billion, what are we getting for it? And what is it we actually want? Now, in a, in a market economy, which is what we live in, uh, you know, the market is determined by supply and demand. And publishers are, to put this bluntly, service providers. So they provide a service to the research community who was funded by the taxpayer. And this service should have added value. And this service uh, should, in principle, compete with other services so that we can get the best prices for uh, for our money. This is the whole concept of the market. This is not what we have in scholarly publishing. In scholarly publishing, we have a, a completely encapsulated captive market. So every research article, to some extent, is a unique product. Uh, it's, it's, it's a one of a kind, and a journal itself is also a type of one of a kind. Uh, let's, let's look at what the real issue is, let's say, with the, with the journals and where they came from. So uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of the name Robert Maxwell. Um, and Pergamon Press many years ago, I don't know if it was the 60s, uh, set up a, a particular type of business model where, where they realized that scholarly, scholars needed to publish and that over time the amount they would publish would increase and the number of researchers would increase. So following the logic, the number of articles would increase and thus the number of venues to host them in principle would increase. And uh, Pergamon set about helping that increase uh, by setting up lots of journals and putting a business model on it. And it was quite clever how they did it. They knew that the key to the journal was the, the editors slash reviewers. So they encouraged, stimulated, wined and dined key academics to join the editorial boards. And then people came. They were attracted by the prestige, of course, start publishing there within their disciplines. And then the journal took off. And what we've seen is an explosion in the number of journals since then. Uh, Pergamon was, of course, bought over by Elsevier, who, who uh, took on this, this very lucrative model, and as many others did. Um, so what we have now is a system where five major scholarly uh, publishers, Elsevier, Wiley, Taylor & Francis, Springer Nature, and Sage, to a lesser extent, dominate the publishing landscape, and particularly in the number of uh, journals that they operate. Most of the deals are being signed with them, and this is where I'd say a large portion of that 10 billion uh, is, is absolutely going. Now, the issue that we have here is that researchers do not have choice. There is no choice to publish. As a researcher, if you do not publish in a branded or high impact factor journal, you are simply not getting a job or you're, you're not getting a higher position. So when you go to a career uh, or a research assessment uh, a meeting, let's say, or you apply for a job, the first thing you will be asked for and typically evaluated on is, where have you published? So I can give an example. Uh, a friend of mine who I won't name uh, it was a researcher in microbiology in, uh, well, in Europe. And uh, this person uh, did not have any major publications and was finding it difficult to get a job. And then they had a, nature, uh, a really high-level nature paper, one, one paper uh, that got to the top, let's say, impact factor journal for their field. And that paper 
essentially not only opened the door uh, to an immediate job offer, full professorship, tenured uh, in a major research institution in Europe, but it led to a whole stream of other offers, uh, lucrative uh, collaborations, partnerships, and even membership in some very high-placed research societies. One journal, one article in one journal uh, put this person on the road to success. So you can see that the power that some of these uh, journals, brands, have on the researchers' careers and lives. So the researchers, in essence, do not have a choice. They will always aim for the highest impact factor journal. Uh, and if they don't get that, it will have negative consequences on their careers. This gives the uh, journals, the publishers, a hugely uh, uh, mixed, uh, how will I say this, imbalanced uh, weight in the negotiations. And this is something uh, that needs to be addressed within the scholarly community. So, you know, in, in essence, if uh, a high, highly branded journal wants an APC of 5,000 euros, researchers are willing to pay it because it's that journal and it's so popular and they know the consequences it will have in their field and they know the consequences it will have in their careers. Thank I don't know if that uh, question addressed that fully. Yes, thank you. I'm going to conclude um, by asking just the last question, if you can just briefly answer that. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for um, making time available. So my question is that, will this work for the private sector? Uh, in South Africa, we've uh, on a lot of pressure to get uh, funders uh, from commercial, from, from private sector, and the pharmaceutical industry in particular, uh, where they don't want some of the results to be published, or if it's negative uh, for yep. the uh, company, they will not allow the universities to, to publish. So what's your view on that? This is this is a really interesting question. I had a discussion last week in Prague with a, a major individual involved in biomedical sciences who said something similar. Um, so th there's a couple of points there that you've raised. Uh, the first thing is to, to disassociate uh, IPR, intellectual property, right from publishing an article. Uh, in Europe, it's different, of course, probably in South Africa, and I know it is in the US, but in Europe, uh, you cannot publish on your patent before you, you essentially patent. So there's no issue there. The article is post-patent. Uh, that's, that's number one. Now, number two is to what extent um, uh, commercial entities involved in research uh, would, would, for instance, have to abide by open principles. Uh, now, the, the, the concept that we use in Europe is as open as possible, as closed as necessary. And what this means is that I'll, I'll take the example of data, not an article. For data, uh, public data in Europe is seen as a public good and should be opened. So... And, and not necessarily immediately and not necessarily fully. It could be opened uh, slowly and it may not be opened completely. There should absolutely be restrictions on certain types of data which should never be opened. For instance, military data, medical data, private data, security data, intelligence data. Uh, where the line becomes a bit fuzzy is when you get to commercial data and specifically when commercial entities engage in collaborations with universities. Uh, the way it typically works is if the funder is paying, the funder gets the mandate. If a company is paying, in principle, the company should be able to decide, right? The difficulty is in the collaborations you're talking about. Uh, this is something that will definitely have to be addressed uh, within Plan S. I know that this is on the table and I know that they're looking into this. There's no clear answer on this. Uh, but I think that the, the answer here really is in the collaboration and negotiation between the parties that we should be moving towards more openness. Uh, the issue... The issue you're referring to finally then is about negative data or negative results, right? In principle, uh, what we have is uh, when it comes to research, we have what is called uh, methodologically sound research. So in principle, we should be able to publish all types of research, not just the sexy research or the innovative research or the excellent research, but research that is methodologically sound. That is not what happens now at the moment. Uh, in many of these journals, of course, they do not publish replication studies. They typically do not publish negative results. Uh, they typically do not publish standard, normal, boring research. Um, that's something that we do need to change, and that's something that will also affect the impact factor. The negative results then you're referring to specifically are where if they publish, if a biomedical company, for instance, publishes uh, results that were negative of a trial, will this affect their image? Um, that's a good question. The conversation I had last week implied yes. I do not have an answer for that, to be honest. Uh, that's something you could potentially discuss there. 
would would you need an exception, for instance, on such negative results? Maybe. Um, but what I would say is that you would like to know that a result has been carried out and has been negative. Otherwise, we're going to repeat the research and we're going to waste more money on this. So maybe the, the answer here is to perhaps rebrand or package negative results as something positive. And that negative results do not show that you're not succeeding, but that you're trying to succeed. And ultimately, that's what we do in science, right? We try to refute, we try to succeed, we do not always, uh, we do not always succeed. And to maybe quote, I think it's Samuel Beckett, fail, fail again, fail better. <laughs>